I'm Becky McCoy, and you're listening to Stories of Unfolding Grace, the podcast about grace during unexpected times. You'll hear from real people dealing with hard stuff, and I hope you'll feel encouraged that you can bravely live through hard stuff, too. You're listening to episode four of Stories of Unfolding Grace. You'll hear me chat with Leanne Marquis of leannemarquis.com. You can find the show notes at beckylmccoy.com backslash zero four. I'm here with Leanne Marquis. Uh, we met, she's a fellow blogger. And she's going to talk about her story today. So why don't you just talk a little bit about the experience that you had that was extremely challenging? Sure. So I have four children, but when I was pregnant with my third child at 12 weeks, we went in for a routine scan. And we were told at that time that the baby's heart was malformed and that we needed to basically see a specialist to make sure the baby would be okay. Mm. So through different testing, we found out that our son's heart was developing outside of his chest. And in addition to that, he had numerous things wrong with his actual heart. So we were told that he would not live. We told, we were actually told that he wouldn't even survive the pregnancy that I would miscarry or uh, that we could terminate. So that was devastating, extremely devastating, unexpected, you know, just, not something that was on our radar at all. And how did you react? I, looking back, I now know that I went physically into shock. I think my emotions just couldn't even handle it. Yeah, totally. Um, thankfully, my husband was with me. Like, he doesn't go, I mean, with our first kid, you know, he like went to all the appointments, uh-huh. and, you know, was really <laughs> doting and all that stuff. <laughs> I mean, by the third one, you know, I'm like vomiting four times a day. He's like, oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, hun. See, you know, so surprisingly, right. he actually was at that appointment because we knew wow. that it was a sonogram. So he's like, oh, you know, I want to see the baby the first yeah. time too. And so he was with me. I immediately like just started crying and I don't even remember what the doctor was saying. I stopped being able to understand words. It was very strange. I just completely went into survival mode. I um, wrote a book about it actually. And in that I say, it's almost like I was in a cave and I could hear my husband and the doctor talking, but I had no idea what they were saying. Yeah. It was just complete physical and emotional shock. Yeah. It's strange because you go into an appointment and life is normal and then all of a sudden it's it's not <laughs> right right something totally different yeah it's crazy so what did you so what happened um talk a little bit more so you got this diagnosis while you were still pregnant so what happened did you carry to term what happened with your son yeah so my husband and i decided that we would continue to carry the baby um until we, like I said, we thought I was going to miscarriage. Yeah. Um, and then at 22 weeks, we had not miscarried yet. So we were able to go see a pediatric cardiologist. And that kind of started our journey to forming a care plan for our son, as yeah. opposed to, you know, a plan for his death. We right. started planning for his life. And it was really a turning point for us because I think those doctors gave us hope. Um, And what ended up happening is that Ryan did go to full term. They took him at 38 weeks during a C-section, highly planned and coordinated between, you know, pediatric specialists, adult specialists for me. Um, There were probably 30 doctors and nurses in the room, you know, and there's typically like five, you know. Yeah. So it was kind of like a crazy day. Ryan was born. He was put on life support. He was on a, a ventilator and hooked up to medicines and we basically just battled for his life for about the next year wow. um, until he was able to come home. And then another year or two, just kind of catching him up to his peers with different therapies. But yeah, I mean, it was a long, hard road, but we did carry the baby and Ryan's seven. So, that's amazing. you know, he that's, made it. Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So what was that like? 
basically living in a hospital for a year with two other kids. I go back when I think about those days, like I can't even believe I got through it. Like if somebody told me the story, I'd be like, no way. Right. Um, (laughs) No, it's impossible. Uh, We had decided early on, we were told that Ryan would be there with his complications. If he lived, he would be there at least a year. Uh, So we knew going in, it was going to be really long. And I had a four-year-old and a two-year-old. So we decided I'm not going to live at the hospital. There's no way this four and two-year-old are going to understand mommy being gone and the baby's going to be sedated so much. He's not going to know. So uh, we lived about an hour from the hospital in the D.C. area. And so, oh, really? Where? Yeah. Um, we lived in Northern Virginia. Are you down there? Oh, I just moved to Connecticut from the D.C. area. So, oh, yeah, okay. we were in yeah, Southern yeah. Maryland. Okay. We were in, like, the Reston, Herndon yeah. area. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my okay, family cool. lives out there. That's awesome. Ah, that's <laughs> a funny. Small world. Yeah. So, we commuted over to, I don't know if you know where Children's yeah. National is. Yeah. yeah, over on Michigan. So, we were commuting from Virginia all the yeah. way over to the other yeah, side. It, it took 50 minutes, no traffic. So. Yeah. Right. And when would, does that happen? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would wake up with the girls and I said, I suddenly was like a stay at home mom who commuted every day. So I would wake up, we'd right. pack our lunches, we'd get in the car, we'd travel to the hospital and we just would stay all day and then come back home at night in time for dinner. Wow. Um, it was hard. It was like survival mode, like literally one foot in front of the other every yeah. single day, just getting it done, you know? So you had this plan of going to the hospital every day and spending that time. And that was like your physical survival plan. How, what was your plan emotionally, mentally? How did you deal? (laughs) Or not not deal. Yeah, right. Exactly. (laughs) I call it a healthy balance between acceptance and denial. Yep. Maybe not denial, but avoidance. One, I just accepted the fact that this is where we were. Like, I can't Mm -hmm. change it. There's nothing I can do about it. There's no reason to say why, you know, or fight against it. Just like, this is where we are. Okay, what do we do with that? Um, So that was good. And I think a little avoidance because the reality was that Ryan could have died any day. I mean, there were times where I went in, you know, he crashed several times. We thought we were going to lose him. Um, And to live thinking about that all the time, you just drive yourself nuts. I mean, even talking about it right now, like my stomach is like in knots, you know, no. just thinking about that, about your kid. Yeah. So I think the, you know, that's the healthy part of avoidance is nope, I'm not going to think about that part. I'm just going to think about this minuscule part of today. Like just get through today mm-hmm. and then we'll deal with tomorrow, tomorrow, you know? Right. Yeah, totally. Been there. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. How did you, how do you feel like that season affected you as a mom to your two older kids and as a wife? Hmm, good question. Because you, I know from the, from the crises that I lived through, you oh people kind of always just think of it like, oh, your kid's in the hospital or your husband is sick, but it's more than that. It affects you on a totally different plane. Yeah. You know, I've never thought that through, like to have a great pat answer. I will say as a wife, I think this generally, but it's just much more exposed in something like this, Mm -hmm. is realizing that my partner's unique and our journey is going to look completely different. So the way it looks for him to grieve is going to be completely different than the way it looks for me to grieve. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, the way it looks for him to be in survival mode, completely different than my, you know, it's like, you kind of want to like, look like a team, like you're on the same page, but there's no coach saying, okay, you run this play and you run this play. It's like, you are just out there on the field running your hearts out. It's more like the amazing race where you're like, we have to do what with what? Like (laughs) you do it. No, you do it. Yeah. Right. (laughs) I don't like the way. No. Yeah. Um, I think just like having patience and grace for my partner and saying, Hey, we're doing our best and we're going to disappoint each other. And that's okay. Cause our journey looks different and it should like, it totally should. Yep. Um, So that was kind of eye-opening for me. And then I think with my kids, during that time, I was really purposeful in having a routine for the girls and kind of normalizing life for them in the middle of crazy not normal and just making sure that I was reading between the lines of their behavior. So I think as a mom, I want to be intentional that I'm building certain skills in them, but also during that time, having the grace to be like, whoa, they're in survival mode too. When I see bad behavior, it's most likely that they're tired. They're off schedule. 
they're sad. Like they feel the anxiety of everything going on around that, you know, things they probably couldn't even articulate. And again, I think that's like a super good lesson, even outside of the hospital walls, just looking at our kids and being like, okay, what's really going on here? What are they trying to tell me that they might not even know themselves? Yeah. It's so hard to help them through when you can't just tell them everything because they, they don't get it, but they perceive that there's something bad happening. Mm -hmm. Choosing to live bravely and authentically is important to me, and I'm guessing it's something you are interested in too. You can learn more about my story at my blog, beckylmccoy.com. Stop by and sign up to receive my monthly newsletter. It includes all sorts of interesting tidbits and family updates. Check the show notes for details. I'd love your help with something. If you're enjoying Stories of Unfolding Grace, please share it with your friends and subscribe in iTunes. If you leave a rating, it'll help other listeners to find the podcast. Thanks so much for being on this journey with me. So uh, in what ways, I like to use this definition of grace, that grace kind of on a daily basis or in these hard times is when good things happen in the midst of a really deep, difficult struggle. So how did you see that happen? I think on a couple different levels, I think our community really came around us Mm. and just that every day needing, just needing things taken care of, the practical things, food and errands and having our house cleaned. I mean, people cleaned our house and and fed us for nine or 10 months straight. Wow. So yeah, I know. Like I didn't even change my own cat's box. Right. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it was, it was really cool. You know, most of them were from our church and it was really cool to me to just see them rally and be the hands and feet of Christ practically every day, you know, providing for us in that way. And I think on a personal level, on a faith level, I learned that God is in the practical stuff. I was raised in the church home. And I mean, we were in church all the time in a really solid Christian home. I have a great foundation. But I think I kind of looked at like, okay, God's still in this box of he's great for my spiritual problems or like if I need something. Yeah. But I've got the everyday covered. Like I'm really efficient. I'm highly organized. Uh I've got my list (laughs) going. I can just check them off, you know. And forgetting that like, yeah, no, that doesn't work. It might work for a while. But without God's grace, every single day pouring into my spirit, forget it. It's just not going to work. Yeah, Um, because all of a sudden when you don't have your checklist and and you can't fall back on that routine, what are you going to do? Right, right. So I think I just, it was this new picture of the gospel for me that not only is Jesus for my salvation, but I mean, he's actually for my sanity. You know, it's like... (laughs) I just came up with that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Write that down. (laughs) Tagline. Um, But yeah, it's like he is for the every single day. It's Grace looks different. And I liken it to grace is like manna. He Mm. gives us what we need every day. We can't collect more. We can't hoard it. He gives us what we need every day and and nothing more. Nothing more, nothing less. Right. That's great. Yeah, it's so true. As a result of your son, Ryan, you said? Yep. So as a result of Ryan's diagnosis and a really traumatic first year of life, and I'm sure that it hasn't been like perfectly easy or smooth since, how have you chosen to live bravely and authentically? I think for me, I've always been somebody who kept things close to the vest. I don't want to say I like hid my flaws from others. I just didn't flaunt them. And my husband always says I'm a tough nut to crack. Yeah. <laughs> I'm mean, like, once you're in there, it's all good. But I think I definitely wore a facade of, and I don't even know if it was a facade. I did have it together. I mean, right? I, you know, I was just yeah. that person. Now, like, forget it. I do not have it together. And I'm okay saying that. Like, I would not have been okay saying that before. It would have bugged the life out of me. And now I'm like, hey, it's who I am. And I think yeah. it's authentic to who I am now. And to the authentic- authenticity of it is letting other people know. Because I think when we all live behind these facades, we stress ourselves out to 
to be like somebody else. Definitely. When in reality, we're all stressing out. We're all, you know, juggling lots of balls and some of them get dropped. I think for me as a person who typically didn't share my inner feelings, now I'm much more apt to come alongside another mom and be like, hey, it's okay. We all mess up. We yeah. all do this and really mean it. Like I might have said it before, but now like I really mean yeah. it. You know? <laughs> right. Common ground. <laughs> right. Right. If someone were to be introduced to you or talk to you and they were pregnant and their child had a similar diagnosis or was born with a similar diagnosis and they have a a small kid dealing with a really serious heart condition like this or any kind of health issue, really, how would you encourage them to handle it mentally, physically, emotionally? What advice would you have? Funny you should ask. I wrote an entire guidebook for people in this situation. Oh, um, awesome. Is that yeah, is it on your it's website? It's on the blog. It's okay. totally on the blog. It's actually, they can get it free on the blog because I felt really bad charging for it. Right. Having been there myself. Yeah. Um, but it is also available in hard copy on Amazon. And that does have a charge just because it costs to print. So, right. but yeah, there's a lot I probably could say. I think the biggest thing is it's going to be hard. Nothing I can say is going to make it easy. And that's normal. Like it's normal to grieve the unexpected, what you thought you were going to have and what you do have, you know, what you lost in terms of expectation. Yeah. And so that's completely normal. Um, they're not alone. There's lots of us out there and we have survived, you know, it's, um, we're fighters, we're fighters and they're going to know what that means. And it's going to be okay. You know, no matter the outcome, people are around you. And if you're a person of faith, God is there to hold you and just really carry you every day. Right. And here you are seven years later. I'm sure you couldn't have even imagined that seven years ago. No. That life would be (laughs) somewhat close to normal ever again. Right. Wow. Well, thank you for, like you said, taking your mask off and being authentic to share this story. And uh, I've got a couple questions that are just purely for fun. Okay. (laughs) So we can all get to know you a little bit better. So the first question is, what are you loving right now? What is getting you really excited and what do you want to share with people? Oh my goodness. I'm such a nerd. Um, That's awesome. Then we're best (laughs) friends. (laughs) Uh, I'm a life coach. So I'm loving, I'm just doing more research on psychology and human behavior and stuff people probably don't even want to hear about. Oh no, I love that stuff. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Um, but yeah, I've been tripping out on some books. What else am I loving? I love the new Star, Star Wars movie. Okay. Hello. That was great. Awesome. And hmm, I always got to have sets of three. I don't know. I'm just loving my family lately. I think I have a renewed joy of having good boundaries of taking care of myself and then being able to take care of them because I kind of, you know, put the oxygen mask on first for me. Right. So. That's great. That's what I love. Since I'm a foodie and I love to cook, my next question is, what is your favorite meal or food right now? Oh, man, that's like asking me my favorite song. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love food. I mean, I just can't even narrow it down. Okay, so I love Mexican food. Yeah. Making some good carnitas lately. Yeah. Not even hard. I should send you the recipe. Sure. Bring it on. <laughs> yeah. Big spread over brie cheese. I love that. Oh, um, yes. What else? I just, biscotti and tea. Yeah. I'm pretty simple, you know? Um, yeah, but those are all delicious, wonderful <laughs> things. Okay. These next two are slightly more serious, and you started to go into the next one that's, what are you doing to take care of yourself? I'm getting up earlier every morning, which sounds like the pits, but I'm finding it works really well to not be woken up with somebody else's needs. Yeah. So I get up, I'm less irritated. Let me just put it that yes. way. No, <laughs> I do the same <laughs> thing. It's so yeah, true. Yeah. I've been trying to get up an hour to an hour and 15 minutes early so that I can go work out, short workout, take a shower without eight eyes looking at me. Like right. my husband <laughs> walk into the yeah. bathroom and be it's like, the worst. <laughs> doing and they're all like literally hanging on the shower door you yeah know? yeah um so I take a shower in the basement hiding from them. <laughs> oh, yes how <laughs> I, what percentage of moms spend their day hiding it's yeah, so I true <laughs> right well new tip take a shower in the basement right <laughs> uh, and then I just try to spend a couple minutes just like reading the bible and just centering myself and kind of just not really taking deep breaths but to me it's like yeah 
Okay. okay. I am grounded and I'm ready for somebody to ask me for something. Right. So. Mom, mom, mom. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the last question is, what are you doing right now to be brave? Oh, I think starting this life coaching business. So yeah, that's huge. Kind of getting myself out there and working with people and hoping I don't mess them up. I mean, so far, so good. All my clients have great feedback and have great. loved it. So yeah, yeah. I'm really enjoying it. That's awesome. Well, thank yeah. you again. You can check out more about Leanne at Leanne Marquis. That's right. Yep. M-A-R-Q-U-I-S-S dot com. Here's a preview of my conversation with Michelle Tolson. Yeah, well, I shut down. I, I didn't realize I shut down. Um, my husband took it really hard. And I actually had to have him call my mother because I knew she was going to think I was going to be in a wheelchair the next day. And that's when I really started to dis- to um, face my disease. And that's when I became much more of an advocate and an educator with MS. Uh, MS is a... It's so uncertain. You you don't know when it's going to attack. You don't yep. know when you're going to get a new sy- symptom. You don't know what the symptom's going to cause. You you don't know how long you have to be like you are. If you're interested in sharing your story of unfolding grace, head to my blog, beckylmccoy.com, and click on the submissions button. I can't wait to hear from you. Thanks again for joining me. I'm really looking forward to next week.